Hello, and welcome to a webinar hosted by the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. This is Noe Santos with the Bureau of Reclamation, and we are very pleased to have Susanna Eden from the Water Resources Research Center at the University of Arizona. Susanna Eden is a Assistant Director at the Water Resources Research Center. She has a PhD in Water Resources Administration from the University of Arizona, and has been engaged with water resources research and, and outreach for more than 25 years. Her research centers on policy and decision making in water management, stakeholder engagement, and the use of scientific information. She was the principal investigator on our project to develop the water harvesting assessment tool for communities in the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative and led stakeholder engagement efforts on groundwater, climate, and stakeholder engagement, a project that introduced a novel modeling framework to incorporate climate variability and change into groundwater management and planning. She also writes for and edits the Water Resource Research Center's quarterly newsletter, the Arizona Water Resource, and the annual Arroyo publication. Thank you everyone for joining us today and thank you to, to Susanna for sharing this work with us. And I will now turn the mic over to Susanna. Everyone, um, first I want to thank Noe for that uh, nice introduction and for the opportunity to talk about the water harvesting assessment toolbox that we developed here at the Water Resources Research Center. Um, it was a, um, a team effort. Um, we didn't do it by ourselves. We had a technical advisory committee um, that um, gave us a lot of advice on what was needed and what was, um, what was missing from uh, the current uh, guidance on water harvesting. And um, the project started out as a guide for utilities to help them assess um, to help them assess uh, the uh, value of water harvesting in more ways than simply uh, augmenting water supplies. So it began as a guide for rainwater and stormwater harvesting potential to meet multiple challenges and provide multiple benefits. It became a toolbox out of the, um, out of the information that we got from utilities, from communities that we I am seeing messages that you can't hear me. Uh, just a moment. Is this better? Can you all hear me now? Can somebody send a message? Um, yes. OK, great. OK. Um, uh, so uh, there is um, the original uh, impetus for storm for uh, rainwater harvesting was the idea that we would um, augment insufficient total supply with rainwater. Um, low price of water, it was very difficult to um, be able to justify rainwater harvesting just on, on um, augmenting supply alone. So um, we tried to point out the many ways, the many problems that water harvesting can solve. And these include reducing a peak demand if you use tanks, um, improving stormwater quality and reducing stormwater volume, and, um, and also having an impact on, uh, on supply and demand during uh, climate change. Um, we provided a number of tools in our toolbox and, and uh, laid out a number of steps that uh, could be used to determine what kinds of problems need to be solved and how water harvesting may be able to solve them. Our area was the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative area. Uh, we did not go into Mexico, but we did try to, um, to deal with problems across the um, 
the the LCC. Um, so, to begin with, the toolbox is used um, in a group. Uh, a local facilitator can be a water harvesting expert, but it doesn't have to be, uh, convenes a group of people from a community who have problems that need to be solved and that are open to um, finding a single solution that may be able to save everyone money and solve problems. And this means getting a lot of diverse people into the same room, not just water supply, but stormwater management and transportation and land use planning and engineering um, are all people who have something to, um, to contribute and, um, and could be interested in the solution. We provided a facilitator guide with facilitator instructions detailing what the group will go through in the eight steps of the tool, use of the toolbox and the use of the five tools that are provided. The first tool is a narrated presentation. It's about an hour long, and it's, um, it covers a great deal of information about rainwater and stormwater harvesting, its benefits, and the challenges that it can help solve. Um, you thought the presentation is stopped um, in order to use the other tools, and um, um, so it's necessary to leave enough time for this meeting. Um, probably two hours would be a minimum because there is a lot of opportunity for discussion. Water harvesting spreadsheet is tool number two. Um, it provides tables and charts that the um, meeting participants discuss and hopefully come to consensus on so that um, they, you, they can see um, what the main uh, challenges are and what the main benefits are of water harvesting. The third tool helps um, determine the water harvesting potential for the particular location. It's a catchment to canopy area ratio spreadsheet that shows you how to estimate um, your water harvesting potential, especially in terms of passive water harvesting um, where landscape is being watered. Tool four is our website, the uh, Desert Water Harvesting Initiative website, um, where there is a lot more data and information, examples, links to other, um, to other sites. And um, during the presentation, um, several of the slides will have this, uh, the eye that you see on the, this slide. And that is a link to the website for more information on the subject that is being covered. There is a wealth of information on the DWI website, and I hope you'll have a chance to visit it. Tool number five is a template, because once the meeting is over and people have come to an understanding of the value of water harvesting, you need to take that information out to decision makers, to other people in the community, uh, other people in, in government, um, decision makers and um, influencers uh, who would be um, important to moving ahead with any kind of water harvesting implementation. OK, step one. Um, identifying challenges. Um, we talked about these before. Potable demand exceeds supply, or there's insufficient capacity to meet peak demand. So you want to augment your supply. Um, but there are other uh, 
there are other challenges. There may be negative impacts uh, on the environment from current water use. Climate change may be having an effect on your supply and demand. There, you may be suffering from an urban heat island effect that can be helped by additional vegetation. Or there may be stormwater problems, such as um, water running in the streets and out into neighborhoods and uh, stormwater quality issues that, uh, that uh, EPA and uh, state uh, water quality regulators are interested in. Once uh, the presentation has gone through a list of challenges and solutions, it's time to pause the presentation and identify the group to identify the challenges that they face and discuss, um, discuss the rankings and um, enter a group consensus so that you can look at the spreadsheet. Now let me show you, uh, let me see if I can show you what the spreadsheet looks like. Here um, you see that it's an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, it's downloadable from the website. And it has um, an example. And then it has a space where the community can put their consensus ideas down and see them in a chart. So um, if your, um, your most important problem is urban heat island, you rank that high. And, um, and um, and, uh, and if your uh, insufficient peak capacity is, um, is not a problem, you rank that low. And then you think out 20 years. Uh, 20 years, uh, it, will the peak capacity be sufficient, or will it be more important then? So you can uh, give it a higher score. And you can uh, say, you can see that, um, that your, your um, automatically shown on the chart what your scores are. And the next step is to evaluate the land use sectors that have water harvesting potential. And there are several. Um, Single-family residential, of course, and multifamily. Uh, commercial scale, which you may want to deal with separately. And of course, the, street, the streets and, oh, or uh, a major stormwater management. All of these um, sectors can be important uh, depending on your circumstance. And the presentation goes through all of them and the possibility, the potential that they have for water harvesting. And once the presentation has, has covered that material, we pause the, again and go through the process of evaluating where um, currently uh, um, the most potable water is used for outside uses and how um, um, water harvesting can reduce um, potable demand now, and then project it by percent growth into the future. The um, 10 years out and 25 years out, and you can see which sector um, is most important. In many places, it usually is the single family residential sector that has the most potential for um, using rainwater harvesting. Step three is to understand the benefits of water harvesting and the strategies and techniques for its use. Um, passive, 
this section of the presentation gives passive and active water harvesting def definitions and then goes into cost and design needs of each kind of water harvesting and what the benefits are of each kind and what the techniques are for each sector. So there's a lot of information in the presentation um, about um, strategies and techniques and benefits. Then it's time to pause the presentation again for more discussion. Um, and this chart really shows that for the, for the problems that have been identified in the presentation and, and by the utilities and, and uh, communities we consulted with, um, water harvesting, both passive and active, are um, potential solutions. Uh, except for reducing peak potable water demand, which requires an active system. Um, you need to have tanks to store the water to have excess water to use um, during peak demand. Now it's time to prioritize water harvesting approaches. So based on the assessment and the discussion that the group has made, um, so based on a review of the previous steps, it's time to rank water harvesting priorities for land use sectors and water harvesting strategies and whether to retrofit versus new construction. Um, uh, here it shows um, the uh, the uh, ratio of retrofitting to incorporating in new sites, which is, in general, less expensive. Let me try to show you uh, the, um, here, um, I'm sorry. Here, you'll see that this, the, the sectors have been ranked for retrofitting and for incorporating in new sites, for the example. And, um, and it's automatically turned into a bar chart to look at the information visually. Uh, step five now is estimating the effective catchment to canopy area ratio for your location. To begin with, catchment to canopy ratio is the ratio of the uh, space where you are collecting the rainwater um, to the canopy of the vegetation that you are trying to support. So the illustration here shows uh, a three to one ratio uh, with presumably uh, more rain during the year and a seven to one ratio where you would need a larger catchment to maintain your vegetation. Estimating the catchment to canopy area ratio is not difficult, but it, uh, it does take several steps. The first step um, is to get the data that you need. And you need, you're basing it on the average annual rainfall and your plant water use data. Now, we have uh, provided, we have provided on a spreadsheet um, that information for, um, for various areas in the Desert uh, uh, Landscape Conservation Cooperative. 
um, as you can see, we have reference ET and um, um, and plant water coefficients um, for a number of cities in the desert LCC. So, so you, if you don't know that information yourself, you can find a city in the, you can find a, a location in the spreadsheet that um, may give you an indication of what the plant water needs are and um, um, and the uh, average annual rainfall. So we take Tucson as an example because that's where we are, um, and take the average annual, average monthly rainfall for Tucson. Uh, is shown on this graph, and it comes out to about 12 inches a year. Uh, most of it in the summer with the monsoons uh, and some in the winter, but very little in the spring. And then you want to be conservative, so you take the effective rainfall which we have estimated at 50%. You can use other percentages for your location, but um, we think 50% is a pretty good uh, conser conservative um, number. And so you calculate what the effective monthly rainfall is for water harvesting purposes. Um, and then you determine what the plant water use needs are. And here we recommend that you use low water use plants. And we have, um, for Tucson, Arizona, the low water use plant demand of about 20 inches. Uh, you can see that obviously plant demand is, is highest in late spring and summer and uh, lowest in the winter. You compare then the effective monthly rainfall to the monthly plant water demand. And you can see for Tucson that there isn't a month where there is a one-to-one. -one. That is, there's no month where there's enough water in Tucson uh, from rain to support, to support um, your low water use vegetation. But if you have a catchment to canopy ratio, that is, if you increase the amount of rainwater that you are capturing for your plant, you can improve um, your position uh, with respect to uh, plant water use and precipitation. And so here you see an area where uh, the, plant, the ratio is 3 to 1. Um, and that you can meet your plant water needs um, eight months out of the year. You can never reach uh, your plant water demand for every month out of the year, even going up to a 10 to 1 ratio. Uh, the other gives you um, a, a drier outlook where it would take a 7 to 1 ratio for you to to meet your plant water demand eight months out of the year. This is an illustration of um, how much vegetation uh, is, um, is tr uh, translates from um, your different uh, catchment to canopy ratios. Um, obviously, you can get, you can uh, provide for the water needs of a greater amount of vegetation with a 3 to 1 ratio than you can with a 7 to 1 ratio. This is an actual uh, photograph that shows the difference between rainwater harvesting for uh, canopy 
and uh, standard landscaping in Tucson, Arizona. And it uh, shows uh, the remarkable uh, change that can be made by uh, employing rainwater harvesting strategies uh, in a multifamily setting. Step six is to follow important design guidelines to ensure water harvesting benefits. And that is you can that water harvesting is uh, a technical skill that needs to be um, done properly. And so the presentation gives examples of what needs to be remembered and what needs to be done in order to make water harvesting, your water harvesting effective. And as you can see on this slide, there is one of those uh, information dots that leads back to the Desert Water Harvesting uh, Initiative um, uh, website for more information. Um, we don't uh, claim that this assessment tool will automatically um, make you a water harvesting expert. Uh, there's a lot more to it. This is merely to talk about uh, what can be done with water harvesting and what its benefits can be and what needs to be paid attention to when you're considering water harvesting. Step seven is to look at implementation. There are, uh, there's a whole range of steps that communities can take to um, begin to see the benefits of water harvesting. And the first is usually to remove any kind of zoning or, or regulatory impediments and develop um, a policy that says this community is, um, is interested in implementing water harvesting. Um, um, and from there, you can provide education and guidance to the public to provide support for uh, policies and policy implementation. You can, it's important to get good data. So um, you can take the opportunity to refine your water harvesting potential data to make it more, um, more specific to your location and to your needs. Um, demonstrate, demonstration projects are always useful. Um, good demonstration projects are needed to let people know what water harvesting can do and to create enthusiasm for um, its um, using water harvesting to overcome challenges. Um, you can create incentives. The city of Tucson, for example, um, reimburses um, uh, people for installing water harvesting on their property. Um, you can also um, use water harvesting as a rezoning condition. Um, you can work with, um, with developers to come up with, um, I, with ways that water harvesting can be uh, integrated into new development without causing, um, causing major problems for the developers. And uh, it's important to bring uh, the community into these discussions, especially if you're going to move on to such things as regulating water harvesting, as Tucson has done with commercial, new commercial construction. And finally, it's time to communicate your recommendations to decision makers. Once, you, once the lists um, and graphs are done, uh, there's a template provided where you can put in your own information um, uh, for your locality to then, and the arguments that you think will work with your key audiences. And um, 
and take this out to others um, to uh, build um, support for a solution that has that, that solves many problems. The lessons we learned from going through this entire process were that you need to assemble a wide group in order to get momentum. You need to have the engineers there, and you need to have the naysayers there in order to be able to discuss and um, move water harvesting forward. Um, it helps if you have an outside tool like the water harvesting assessment toolbox or other expertise that can counteract internal stalemates. Uh, bringing in outsiders can often um, um, unblock um, log jams. Um, there are many drivers for water harvesting besides saving potable water. And I think that one of the main things that the water harvesting assessment toolbox does is to, um, is to look into and, um, and raise other, the other benefits of water harvesting. Um, besides saving potable water, so that um, if there is justification needed for implementing water harvesting, that there are uh, more than saving money for water, for example, to, uh, to justify it uh, in, a, in a more livable space, in um, saving energy from, from um, shading and um, from um, providing um, some water quality uh, um, mitigation and, um, and stormwater uh, management um, by capturing the water where, closer to where it falls. Um, it helps um, to look at cost savings in all kinds of infrastructure, not just for the utility, but also um, transportation. We heard that, um, that there were problems with um, maintenance and, uh, and that using water harvesting techniques can um, lower those costs. Um, so look across government functions and see what problems are being solved and what um, cost savings there may be. Um, there's always a we always put in a plug for quantifying, um, getting the data for what you have accomplished. And, um, and as I said earlier, in you need to install good public site examples. We have um, had news uh, in the last uh, few months that our water harvesting assessment toolbox has been um, uh, collected with, um, um, with other tools in the U.S. Climate Resilience Toolkit. So you can find it not only on our website, uh, the Desert Water Harvesting Initiative, but also on, um, on the U.S. Climate Resilience Toolkit website. Um, that was a quick summary of how the, um, the toolkit works. And um, I would be happy to take any kind of questions about how uh, it was developed or uh, any questions that I have raised in this um, presentation. So. Um, Great. Uh, thank you, Susanna. Yes? Yeah, uh, yeah, so if anyone dialed in on the phone, if you enter star pound, you can uh, unmute yourself and ask a question. Or if you're on the, uh, if you called them through your computer, you can uh, raise your hand and I'll, I'll un unmute you to ask a question. 
Uh, in the meantime, though, I have a, I have a question, Susanna. Um, yeah. Have you held this workshop like with a group of people be before in the past? Yes, um, we did. Um, <clears throat> we have actually held several of them during development. So um, the answer is that the final product product we went to a um, in developing it, the the product we went to several communities. We went to um, Sierra Vista and Marana and Sawarita, various small uh, communities uh, in the in southeastern Arizona, um, and got and um, assembled a group, a diverse group, in each community, and uh, went through the discussions with them, and used their input to refine the tool. When we had completed the tool. We went to a um, a small cities um, uh, meeting where the toolbox was tried out with the representatives from a group of small cities, and um, the outcome of that was very interesting. But we learned that if you want to be able to fill out the spreadsheets and um, actually come up with a particular um, strategy for implementing wa uh, water harvesting that you really need to focus on a single community because the multiple communities were so varied that they had different challenges and different priorities. Um, so uh, since then, we haven't been out we haven't actually seen ourselves where it has been tried out. Great, thanks. I see some people there are typing a question. Mm -hmm. uh, I just un unmuted Tim in case he wants to ask it verbally. I oh, have a question there on, on the chat there. The question reads, really like the catchment to canopy ratio tools since many desert trees are adapted to periods of drought. For example, they can survive from May to June with little to no water once established. Any thoughts on how to reflect that? Um, well, uh, we have had, um, we have assumed, uh, as many have, that when you are establishing low water use plants, you need, you will need to supplement water in the, especially in the May June area, um, but that you will use much less water, and that once the plant is is well established, it may be able to survive um, uh, typical periods of of no water. And uh, Ted, uh, I actually I muted you if you'd like to ask your question in person. Uh, yes. So I'm a rainwater harvester here in Flagstaff. I work for the U.S. Geological Survey. And it's been wonderful because we're getting drier, but we're also um, experiencing increased number of frost-free days. So our growing season has increased, and the water is becoming more useful than ever. We also know that um, in states like Colorado, it's not even allowed. And I'm wondering how we resolve this when we try to communicate the value towards achieving resiliency to our colleagues. Uh, and people mm -hmm. say, well, it's, is it something that's even legal? And I say, well, it is here, but in other places it may not be. Is there any chance you think that rainwater harvesting might become outlawed in Arizona? I think the trend is in the opposite direction. I think um, Colorado has been reexamining um, its, its rules, and that um, here in Arizona there are still folks who um, would like it to be demonstrated to them that they're not losing their surface water rights by people catching rainwater on their roofs. But I think that that has been um, pretty well demonstrated, if, at least for our area, and that, um, that the trends are all toward 
more use of water harvesting as uh, water scarcity uh, increases. Yes, and that's, and that's just my feeling. And that's my concern as things become a bit tighter and tighter, this discussion will probably become elevated between those who yes. who have water rights in this part of the country and those of us who are merely property owners. And I know that um, in some cases, well, for instance, I heard that last year or in the past two years, there was a new referendum in the Denver met metropolitan area uh, where the voters were asked whether they wanted to support the idea of merely collecting 30 gallons of rainwater per household, and it was defeated. I couldn't believe it. No, I'm... I didn't hear about that. That is, just, that is. Uh, where did that happen? Uh, my understanding was in Colorado, and it was uh, related mm -hmm. to the Denver metropolitan area. So as uh -huh. as water becomes more and more of a valued commodity, of course, in the Southwest, which of course it is, uh, this whole discussion, I think, uh, becomes more and more interesting. And we're lucky that uh, for for private residential owners, anyway, it's uh, it's still legal here in Arizona. And I know that. When there were initiatives here with the Forest Service up on the Colorado Plateau to expand the number of uh, cattle tanks at one point, um, SRP got involved, and the Salt River Project uh, made that an issue and put a put a stop to it with some pressure on the on the Federal uh, Forest Service. But that, that's my concern: is we kind of have a great resource tool to use, and I really appreciated your uh, presentation. I'm just concerned that there's not consistency throughout the states. Um, in how it's going to be regulated or controlled or, or just uh, laissez-faire. So anyway, thank you for your presentation. Oh, you're welcome. Yes, I think that, um, I think that um, for the time being um, that water harvesting is unlikely to be uh, regulated except at the local level. Um, and, um, but, um, but as you say, as things get tighter, there will be there will be a conflict because people will see that um, water is coming out of the sky that is not being used where it falls uh, without water harvesting, and so the people who, downstream um, would have to be convinced that that is not water that they would eventually get. Um, so it's uh, it may well become a, a conflict area uh, around here in the future. You're right. Um, but I think that the, um, the uh, argument about free water coming out of the sky uh, and we need it here is a pretty strong one. I, I just have one more comment. If I don't mean to, uh, to dominate the whole discussion here, but in evaluating the cost benefit for any any given project, my point also would be that um, you mentioned earlier in your presentation that the, that the cost of water was so inexpensive that it wasn't it was somewhat of a barrier to trying to convince people to go there. But I would maintain that the value of rainwater versus uh, city water supply that might be potable but might also be uh, containing chlorine and minerals hard water, if you will, the value of the softer water, the rainwater, to the landscape plants is, is huge. I've seen that change in my yard, in my garden. The rainwater mm -hmm. is much more mm -hmm. valuable to me than the equivalent volume of city water, although it's not potable in my system. It seems to be uh, just what the plants ordered. Yeah. Well, um, putting all of those into a a cost-benefit analysis is uh, um, uh, uh, complicated, um, but um, valuable. Um, do I have another question? I see um, Tim Kirkpatrick. Um, do you want to el uh, elaborate? Is there any literature on addressing water harvesting in areas of total runoff allocation? Um, I don't know. Yeah, I, um, I just turned uh, Tim's microphone on, so if he uh, wants to elaborate, mm -hmm. he can speak. You can hear Tim. Oh, you can't use mic. Okay, I guess we'll just use his question. <laughs> um, 
So I guess he has a question about supporting the need, uh, the need for a diverse discussion. Um, he's kind of wondering how do we go about assembling such a group to you know, kick off this um, kind of it's in, discussion. It's um, useful to have uh, an advocate on the inside. Uh, we, when we were assembling groups for discussion, um, we usually went through someone who was already a, a supporter of water harvesting, but who was internal to, um, to the communities, government, and, um, and uh, uh, d diverse um, groups who um, had uh, influence on various kinds of decisions across the community. Um, I don't know of a, um, uh, a magic bullet, how do you go about assembling such a group, except that you identify who you want to be there, what kinds of people should be there, and um, what are the challenges that, uh, that uh, are, um, can be, can be, um, Solved by water harvesting, but um, are not don't come immediately to mind, like stormwater management or like like um, water on the roads and and what transportation engineers have to deal with. Um, so identify uh, yourselves what groups, what people you want to have assembled, and then use. Um, Use the sustainability person or someone inside the uh, the government who can um, introduce you to or or can get the interest of all these different people that you have identified. Is that um? Yeah, hopefully that answered his question. Um, I guess he had a question mm -hmm. about a. Uh, I think you had a question on literature addressing uh, water harvesting in areas where uh, all the water is allocated. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if you've seen any kind of papers that discuss uh, policy on that while working on this um, project. And um, allocation to agricultural uses. That's, um, that's I haven't seen um, a lot of literature on that. Um, there was a study, which they did in Colorado, in order to determine um, um, what happens to the rainfall and, uh, and how much of it goes into runoff into an allocated system and how much of it is evaporated and never reaches that system. Um, and they used that as the basis of, 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 of loosening. Um, their regulation on water harvesting. Um, but I haven't seen very much literature that goes into that, um, into how water harvesting and, um, and surface water allocations um, for agriculture or for, for any use um, have, um, have been reconciled, if that's the question. Well, yeah, thanks, Susanna. Mm -hmm. uh, see, are there any other questions that people want to talk? I see, it's like Peter and Tim are typing in another question here short, shortly. I guess uh, in, in the meantime, uh, have you received any feedback from like, different cities or engineering firms that have used the assessment toolbox, like in planning studies or uh, re research projects? Um. No, um, uh, we have um, tried to track um, who is using the site and uh, what they're using and, and uh, how much of the site is being used. But um, we don't know and haven't received any feedback from people who have taken the tool and used it themselves. Um, 
so I can't I can't give you any feedback on that. Okay, yeah, not a problem. And then if it's uh, okay with you, information. Yeah. Um, let me um, let me go back here. Um, okay. Um, that's my telephone number. Um, and um, an email address. And I would be happy to um, talk with anybody more later if someone wants to contact me. Perfect. Yeah, thanks, Susanna. Looks like uh, Peter's still typing there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh. Uh, can you expand on your question, Peter, about uh, supplying help? Is that what your question was? I think we might have lost Peter, but uh, oh dear. Yeah. It's okay. Well, um, if Peter is still there, um, I, as I said, I would be happy to talk to anyone about um, about this if you'd like to contact me. Um, cool. Yeah, I'm sure they'll really appreciate that. We do not have we do not have uh, as standing by anyone uh, to um, to um, help uh, to to support activities uh, in water harvesting activities but we can we can um, give advice and and, um, uh, and I'm ha happy to talk talk about um, projects or ideas cool. I don't know if you can uh, supply facilitators. For... Um, that's a possibility, um, but um, we don't have we don't have the resources to support facilitators, so we would have to um, um, we would have to um, come to an arrangement for support. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Susanna. It's. Um... Yeah. And on that note, I just want to thank everyone for participating on this call, and thanks again to Susanna for taking the time to be with us today. And as a reminder, we did record the webinar, so it'll be available on our YouTube channel, and you can access it by searching for Desert LCC on YouTube, and the channel should pop up. So once again, thanks everyone for calling in, and thank you for your, your great questions today, and we hope that everyone has a great day.